So the first case is Master S. He's a 15-year-old boy who's brought to the clinic by his mother and elder brother. He's good at studies. These are real-life cases with some modification. He was diagnosed to have type 1 diabetes around the age of 8, 10 years. He's um, currently on pre-mixed insulin, um, human mixed start 30 by 70, 30 in the morning and 30 at night. His main presenting complaint was tiredness and glucose levels around 350 to 450 milligram per deciliter most times when they check it, which is not very often. And only on deep probing, the boy accepts that he doesn't take his insulin regularly because he's fed up of taking his medications. And on examination, he was found to have a height of 165 centimeters, weight of 53 kilograms, with a BMI of 19.5 kilograms, and is currently going through puberty with a frank stage four development. And his blood test shows an uncontrolled diabetes with a fasting plasma glucose of 336, Postnatal glucose of 456, HP1C of 13.7 percent, urea 20, creatinine 0.7, and the urine protein did not show any ketones. So my question, first question to the panelist, is what is the ideal HP1C target for this boy? So we have a teenager who is not very keen to uh, take injections regularly. So what would be the ideal HP1C target? Less than what he's got. <laughs> but I, I think uh, there are quite a lot of issues. But I mean, if you want a specific answer for A1C, somewhere around 7 to 8 is even better. Uh, if you don't have an ideal uh, level of between uh, 6 to 7, something like that, it may be too tight for it. Probably, yeah, I would say somewhere around 7 to 8. But there are a lot of factors that you need to be corrected. Or, Before we set the targets, there are a lot of issues in this family that needs to be targeted. So I think instead of us declaring the targets to the family, we need to sit, sit with them, talk to the parents, and we can probably convince the child. I think there more time needs to be sent to convince the child that he needs to take his medicines properly and instead of some therapy available. But I think there has to be a compassionate approach and probably more time spending in educating the parents as well. So, the so I think the target, 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 I think that's not the first thing that needs to be spoken to them. It's far away from Ideally, now that they say that we don't need to realize that we have to keep them below 7%, even in type 1 diabetes, but I think that should be handled at the latest in this period. The other important thing is to not to panic and try to drop it too quickly. Uh, when we see HP1C of 30, we really don't want to see HP1C of 7 or 8 the next month from that following months. That is going to really harm the patient. So we have to General consensus, shall I take it as HPOC, you should not be targeting first, and there are lots of other issues to be targeted, and usually for adolescent patients, we are not going to go for a time control as well, and when it's really bad, we don't want you to bring it out really quickly as well. So the next question is, he is currently on a breathing mix insulin, 30, 0, 30, and his weight that is around 52 kilograms. So what, what would be the ideal insulin regime for this patient? Again, uh, for all these questions, we have to stop with, we are going to look at the whole course here and identify the other issues before we decide on this. But one important thing is when there is a concern of compliance, um, we just need to make sure any minimal regime which is going to keep, make sure the patient is on insulin 24 hours a day. That is more important, at least at basal level. So that should be the first step. So we need to ensure any regime which ensures the patient is at least on a basal insulin.
I think the general consensus is make sure it takes insulin and keep it simple in the shoe. Excuse me. Volumes are very low. We can't hear you properly. We can't hear you properly except the gentleman second from my left. Close to the mouth. Okay, so the next thing is he's 15 years and he's going through puberty. So what impact does puberty have on diabetes control? Um, his diabetes control is poor. So definitely with such a poor diabetes control, you can expect both his growth, warnings, delay. Just puberty is going to be delayed. So all three, both growth as well as puberty delay is going to be there because one and diabetes control is poor. Nutrition is also important. So two factors which go get away and go to both that puberty. What about puberty affecting diabetes? Impact of puberty on diabetes? Because of the hormonal changes? Yeah, and I think in the present scenario is going to have a delayed puberty. So he's going through puberty at the moment, sir. He's going to okay. stage 4. Yeah. Puberty, puberty, yes, hormonal changes could alter the insulin requirement. Definitely the insulin requirement will change. This puberty is part of And uh, again, you know, try to get things under control. Make sure sugar is as close to 124 hours a day. Things are not changing. Okay, the uh, pubertal stage, that is a little bit of insulin resistance here due to the growth but so we just need to be alive. I think next is the most important thing, how to motivate this type of patients and their family. I think this was started, the discussion itself it came on, but it's easily said than done. So what are the things we can do? I'd say Dr. Manan and Manan Manachala did put quite a lot of important things. But what is the panelist feel we can do to improve this and make them deal with this condition better? I think the first thing is to motivate them to come and see a doctor. <laughs> and, and after that, probably, I think uh, somewhere around, I think Manoj was saying about uh, uh, patient education and other things. So somewhere around that line, so I think if you've got a group uh, of uh, young kids who are already there, uh, involving them in that group and uh, family can attend that. And then just simple rules of uh, how to do the injection and how to about the hypoglycemia, about the diet and everything. So it has to be going as a family, the uh, education has to go in. And then stress the importance of uh, uh, good glycemic control and also mention about the serious uh, potentially life-threatening conditions like DKA. You explain that very, very clearly to the family in a group. Uh, that's what I think personally uh, I have done. And uh, uh, that makes them to learn faster and then get more involved rather than uh, 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 rather than just doing it individually because you say that it's like uh, telling somebody, okay, you are going to have a heart attack when they are uh, having a BMC of 10, they won't realize that they are going to get a heart attack. And you say it's BMC 14, you will go into DKA, they won't realize. But I think you have to explain uh, probably, I mean, they will be well listening. It's like a pregnant lady, once they deliver at that time, you go and talk about, uh, uh, about uh, contraceptive, this thing. It is like that, I think, when when they have, unfortunately, if they have an MDK, even for example, go at that time and then discuss, and that will give us uh, immense education. But I think personally, uh, group uh, involvement with the family members and educate them diet, insulin, same techniques, uh, what are the simplistic ways that we have done and how we can be communicated, how to monitor home glucose monitoring, stuff. that kind of thing, we can do that we want to Personally, from experience in the UK, where we see patients who are this, this transition clinic where they are handed over from the pediatric group to the adult, we see a clear difference where during the pediatric age group, the environment of the clinic is so friendly to the patient. There are enough people around, they feel so comfortable. But when you are coming to the adult clinic, you are made to look like you know you are on your own, and then you are put on, the first thing you ask is what is your blood sugar, what is it, you know, the conversation shouldn't go that way, you should win the patient first. It doesn't have to be a detailed discussion on the very first clinic visit, a casual conversation, talking about social aspects or something so that the patient feels comfortable to see us. If the patient comes back second or third time, then then there's more chance you we can get a control in the long term. I think any family who has some with type 1 diabetes, they often feel isolated. 
first of all, the parents are not fully educated. The child himself will be educated. So I think in a clinical scenario, if we have a group of type 1 diabetic patients and families, it would be good to have, say, monthly meetings where the parents get to meet each other and we educate them probably as a group. We involve the diabetic educator, the nutritionist, the doctor, and we have monthly meetings where the parents also get to learn from other parents how they manage their difficult children. I think that would make the scenario much more, uh, you know, so the Zoom discussion with yes. patients and the parents. Yes. That so effort has to be put in a clinic, but effort also has to be put on a general scale, where the family as such have somebody to relate to, probably they can have contact numbers of other patients also. I think that self-help group should be established in our country, and probably in every clinic to start with, and probably in every state. Yeah, I think that would be quite useful for most of the patients that are in the I totally agree with my colleagues and uh, we have also heard a very nice talk. So I think a group therapy uh, where you know children at school levels, children with cerebral problems, the kids uh, in the group which Dr. Chalma was talking about, probably that would help in a big way in addition to because first the support I have. I think uh, uh, Dr. Manoj Chawla touched upon this, so he suggested that we need to be screening microvascular complications regularly. But my question would be, what, when would you start screening the patients? So someone who's developed diabetes, for, like this chap, he had diabetes for the last five years now. So he was diagnosed when he was age 10 and he's 15. So do we need to wait till he, say, becomes 20, 25, or what would be the ideal time to start screening? Uh, he's had diabetes for five years. I think minimal uh, getting a urine microalbuminuria and fundus examination immediately, I think, is a must. And probably follow the video. So I think it's ideal to start now and then continue. And when to start screening for macrovascular complications like blood pressure management and lipid management? Uh, unless there is an associated condition that you are thinking, uh, I would uh, go into I mean, blood pressure. You do it routinely in the clinic uh, for a 15 year old, probably you would do it. But uh, unless there is something, uh, then I would go into looking at heart and other things. Uh, two things uh, would be essential one is blood pressure monitoring every six months. Uh, number two is lipids. Is but you should have a good diabetic control, blood sugars and normal sick before you look at like this. Thank you. So the last question for the first case is, would you consider <coughs> insulin pump for this patient, provided he stays motivated? Okay, you, you give an answer to the question. <laughs> if the patient is motivated, definitely all type 1 diabetes uh, should be considered, I'm not saying should have, but they should be considered whether they would benefit from the insulin pump. But clearly, we got a long way to go in this patient, and the insulin pump is not that easy. Piece. It requires enough knowledge, enough motivation, and a good understanding. So any child, when we are comfortable with that, definitely, they should be considered at least. So it's not only the patient motivation, it's the daddy's motivation to spend from pocket. <laughs> but sometimes they do come and demand pumps, saying that put it on, people. So you are a lucky doctor. Yeah. Can I work with you? <laughs> no, just seriously, I'm asking. So if someone comes to comes to us and says, I, I, I'm fed up with the disease, I want to put a pump on them. If, you, if they can afford, that's the best thing you and me know, is that it is an insulin delivery system. And uh, it, that they've got a patient's key to get blood. Uh, I'm not sure if this patient who can't even give twice daily insulin will be motivated for a pump. But I'm saying, I think if they are really motivated, they can afford, why not? So one other aspect is some kids are very knowledgeable in the sense that uh, they know that if you have an insulin pump, there is a very small chance of going for a DKA. So they just keep that as a baseline. So that they don't take it further. They say, okay, I've got an insulin going all the time. I'm not going to get DKA. I'm not going to bother further about controlling the glucose. So if that's the case, again, that's, uh, it might avoid the DKAs, but it's not going to make further progress in controlling the blood glucose. Further. Thank you. So we'll go to the second case. Any questions from the audience? On the first case, the audience will be in there. 
I think the ideal scenario would be, I think we discussed the risk of challenges in the family because somebody can't even give twice daily insulin, you can't go for more than that. Uh, that's what Dr. Moti was saying. Uh, the ideal scenario and what is practically is different for this patient. Ideally, basal bolus. And that would be better. So you give a basal insulin and then with each meal you give insulin and then insulin pump. These are the fantastic options. But in this patient, you should consider what is available and you speak to the family and decide, okay, it is possible to take only twice daily. If three injections is possible on twice daily basis, you know what I'm saying. So uh, you give a basal insulin at a rapid acting in the morning, he goes to school, lunchtime, not taking anything, and then comes back and take the rapid acting in the evening. So that is one way to do. And, uh, or if he says no, no for three injections, two injections, then go for mix the same insulin, uh, but adjust with the adjusting, or you can go for analogs. So we'll move on to the second case. Uh, this is a 17-year-old female. With uh, presence with two weeks uh, of asthmatic symptoms, polyuria, polydipsia, and uh, six kgs of weight loss in the last two months. There is no family history of diabetes, and her BMI is 28.1, which is on the high side. And uh, blood test revealed her fasting plasma glucose is 150 mg and postprandial is 300 mg per dm, with HbA1c of 8.9%. Other uh, biochemical and renal evaluation tests are normal. These are the test uh, patients' uh, presence at the time of consultation with you. So, the first question is, uh, before ordering for the test, clearly what are the diagnostic possibilities you will consider in this patient? So, here is a young lady uh, who has come with uh, rapid onset, recent onset symptoms and uh, with no family history. So, I think uh, we, uh, we have to go into the history probably a little more in detail. Uh, that is, prior to this weight loss, had she gained weight? And was she overweight in her childhood? And what is her periods pattern? When did she attain her menarche? Are her cycles regular? Is she a PCOS phenotype? So uh, I think what we what is uh, clinically uh, seen is she is an obese lady who has lost six kilos. But what was the pattern of weight through childhood? Has there been a recent weight gain followed by an acute weight loss with the onset of osmotic symptoms? Probably that will give us a clue. Then we go on to a physical examination where probably we will look for signs of insulin resistance. In this patient. So uh, that is one. Was there any preceding fever or uh, any other associated uh, like in the recent infection that has specifically to look at the episode? Um, these are the things that would, I would uh, ask for in the least two weeks. This uh, female has entered puberty at age of 14 and her menses are regular. And there has been no, she has been overweight since childhood and no recent sudden weight gain preceding the onset of diabetes. And uh, there has been no infection prior to this diagnosis. So, these are the basic test ordered after the first consultation. Her ketones was negative. There was no atherosis in this patient. Her uh, GAD antibody was negative. And the fasting sleep peptide level after the diabetic control was 4.9 nanograms per day. So, what are the possibilities? Is that there is a, uh, the C peptide level shows that there is a very good beta cell reserve in this patient. Uh, the pancreatic autoantibody, at least the panel is negative, the urine ketone negative. So I think I would definitely entertain a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes in this patient as a first possibility. But probably we should keep a watch on this lady because there is a subset of uh, uh, insulin requiring late onset autoimmune diabetes who could be GAD antibody negative. We have not looked at the other panel of insulin autoantibodies. So we need to keep this patient under follow-up. So routinely, will you order how many antibodies you will check routinely in a young patient who is considered to have type, type 1 diabetes? Two or three antibodies or the five antibodies? So other panels. Uh, my personal experience, I, uh, I don't have fixed number of antibodies to check. The more number of antibodies gives a better uh, yield. But uh, in a setup, uh, it all depends whether the patient is affordable. The immediate thing would be is to assess the patient regular basis. 
and uh, I think it's going to be a body would definitely improve the possibility. But again, I, practically, I don't think it makes any difference immediately. So, so uh, if the immediate thing is how we are going to manage the patient and uh, make sure uh, clearly the patient is in slow opinion, so that needs to be addressed. And then uh, subsequent visits, we can think about checking the other and what is also. Practically, if you do only see for the gear and what, just I mean, even that I think, as you were saying that you have to consider not treating the patient first, and um, you can do see for the gear which you have done. I'm not sure whether just going into details. The time being, maybe the right way to do it, just try to manage the patient first. We have to do a good profile and other markers. Uh, like to profile, the trigger strain was mildly elevated. I don't have the exact results. Other things were normal. And, uh, other parameters were normal. Yes. Mild hypertrichosis. Very true about the antibodies. Cause factor, patient complaints, even getting the care at times it's difficult. It's expensive. So the more better. But if you can get a gang itself, I think we are lucky more times. I think the second question was uh, discussed in this discussion. So, uh, antibodies are discussed. So, what is the useful of C peptide in the diagnosis, differential diagnosis, and uh, what cutoffs do you follow to differentiate between the type 1 and type 2? Will you do only fasting or fasting and active food? Um, I think C peptide is checked in both fasting and fed state. Uh, but I think one thing to note is that we should not look for C peptide in the person who has come with very, very low glycemic control because of this phase of glucotoxicity where there could be an inherent suppression of insulin secretion. So I think we should not rush to that. If the patient has come with very high blood sugars, probably we should not check CPEP at that time. So those are the things which could actually cause a variation in the CPEP Otherwise, probably it's a fair enough guide to tell us what is the beta cell reserve in that point. And, uh, what values do you take as uh, beta cell? Yeah. This particular value is pretty high and any value below say 1 or even like less than 0.5 uh, in a fed state, what we be taking that? Uh, I personally don't put much stress on C-peptide on the initial stages. This patient could be very well at time born in his honeymoon stage and they could have some residual C-peptide and clearly that depends on what's, whether the patient is glucotoxic which can possibly suppress the levels. So I, I personally really don't stress much on C-peptide and other stages. So C-peptide can be useful but don't uh, rely too much on C-peptide. Check C-peptide after good glycine control. This is an important take home message. So what would be initial treatment in this patient? Given this uh, clinical findings and lab results. Will you start uh, on insulin? Start with insulin with the kind of sugars she has come with fasting above uh, 300 and post meal above 400. You should start her with a good diet regimen and insulin therapy initially. And as the sugars come under control, and uh, probably in 4 to 6 weeks' time, that could also help the glucotoxic phase. And then probably we could consider metformin later. Very, very important when we say treatment is to get the family fully understand the diagnosis, the implications. And uh, they are definitely going to most likely to be in a bit of a shock. So to make sure that uh, they understand that you know there is enough support available. So treating the whole family is equally important to make sure uh, they will be compliant with insulin and understand the importance of insulin. So subsequent to good control, you stop insulin and uh, keep her on metformin, or uh, you have to continue insulin. Uh, I think, um, as Madam was saying, you, you want to start on initially first and get the control right and add a metformin. And you see, with 500 of metformin, you see the A1C is controlling very well and everything. You just try to withdraw. I, I, I suspect probably you want to do a PD insulin or basal and something like that you want to start. So you want to just probably reduce the dose slightly um, and then uh, increase metformin dose and you are happy with one gram of metformin long acting the whole thing is under control, then why can't you stop insulin with the C peptide and everything and see how it goes. Uh, but it has to be, as Madam saying, that even if you are uh, starting on oral tablets, you have to just be very alert and thinking that it could be a type 1. Yeah, but the uh, good uh, C peptide uh, reserve, 
yes, the Honorable Minister will have a good control with the protocols if he is gone. And uh, start with the form and uh, depending on the requirement you can add on a second one also. So I think uh, once the control comes with insulin, <coughs> and good sleep at time, the seven insulin will be stopped and managed with oral drugs, metformin plus other combination. Of course, lifestyle alterations, diet, weight, all that has to be managed. This patient was started on insulin and subsequent to control, she is doing fine with metformin alone along with lifestyle combination. So we we'll move on to the next case. So the third case is a 10 year old boy with 3 years of type 1 diabetes. He is on three thrice daily pre meal regular insulin and bedtime glass. He is on basal bolus insulin. His height is 125 centimeters, which is 10 centile, and weight is 22 kilograms, which is of the 5th centile. His HbA1c in the last one year suggests he has got a good control with the HbA1c of 6.6 to 7.2 percent. He is having recurrent hyperglycemia, which has been bothering the family for the last three months. There has been no change in the physical activities and insulin doses has been stable for the last one year. And he's also lost three kilograms in weight in the last two months. In the last week, his parents noticed that few of the readings, what is, when they were doing the routine checkup, were between 40 and 60, and he was completely asymptomatic with this hyperglycemia. So they were worried. So the questions to the panelist. What are the possible reasons why this boy has got a good control, well-motivated patient is having recurrent hyperglycemia in the last few months and it is also having very low readings recently. So what would be the possibilities? Type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. So I think when we have one autoimmune disease, we should always keep the other type autoimmune diseases in mind. So if a well controlled patient starts getting like a person, you the same state of course. Probably we should try to think of underlying autoimmune insufficiency as a possibility. Does he have any markers of autoimmune disease? Or what is his thyroid profile like? And, and these are the things which we will look for. Does he have any celiac disease or even malabsorbed state? Has that has he been worked up for that? So these are the things I think adrenaline insufficiency is something which So so that's what we wanted to discuss about. So so these are the things which can affect the hyperglycemia autoimmune diseases, which is so common. So I think when someone presents like this, so we start thinking about it. So First thing to do would be to make sure that they don't have Alzheimer's disease. So this patient did not have any features of Alzheimer's crisis or um, uh, other markers, but um, he had some diarrhea. So we are worried whether he would have more absorption. So this patient, when would you start, or ideally for any patient with type of diabetes, is there a time when you would recommend checking for celiac disease? There is no timing for it. If you diagnose a child to have type 1 diabetes, I think all children with type 1 diabetes should be screened for an insidious disease. They need not be symptomatic initially. I mean, the diarrhea comes much later. So, uh, we should do it because we have a blood test available, the tissue with transcriptamase antibody, which we could do uh, as a routine. See, I think uh, the autoimmune disease should be in the back of your mind all the time. And when they have any changes in insulin requirement, like going up or going down, um, uh, after ruling out all the insulin techniques and analog right, production and uh, proper uh, meal and carbohydrate, uh, whatever dose adjustment for normality, whatever you want to do, you're doing everything. And in spite of that, there is the possibility of severe red glycemic excursion. Then it should alert you, okay, I, this is the time I'm going to screen. Um, and then again, as puberty comes in, or something that is vague happening, you should just keep it in mind and check for all these conditions. I would uh, do a celiac screening because the patient has got diarrhea and hypoglycemia is happening. And that can, once the cortisol insufficiency is being ruled out, you can just do an IgA gliadin antibody and just check for it. And I would also do a, a pernicious anemia screening by doing parietal cell antibody. Well, yeah. Serum B12 estimation also. I don't think that even So what could be possible explanation for lack of symptoms of hyperglycemia? So it's got hyperglycemia and now that is now. So what would be the potential reasons? Um, sometimes uh, 
it's a bit unfortunate that uh, some good patients who do all the hard work have to pay the price of having a good glycemic control and this is likely to have developed over a period of time where initially it could have stopped, stopped with uh, having episodes of uh, borderline hypoglycemia and gradually this patient drifting into uh, hypoglycemia and awareness. It's likely to have developed over a period of time and it's because of the usual timing of monitoring and uh, the times when there are higher, at higher risk of hypoglycemia when these patients are going to have a very borderline hypoglycemia when they are asleep, asleep they might not recognize this and this could gradually further develop into the other awareness. This is usually the commonest cause. I mentioned the HP was 6.2%. So this child was under very tight glycemic control. I must have been having recurrent episodes of mild hypoglycemia unidentified. That would have led to another illness over a period. How to correct this? Is there a way so that they can come out of that? Mild hypoglycemia, relax on the regimen. Probably we need to look at the CG of this in this child and monitor it. Or probably relax on this. So by relaxing it, they will start getting the symptoms after some time so that they can recognize it and act for it. Uh, different approaches. One approach could be if, if we could uh, uh, afford to do a, a continuous glucose monitoring on the current whatever rating patient is coming in, we should make sure, tell them that just to follow what they are doing when they are doing the CGMS. Because sometimes when, you, when we tell them that we are doing continuous glucose monitoring, that might uh, change how they put the insulin and they can give a false picture. So that's the important thing is to identify what are the dips and clearly look into the insulin options and clearly these patients there is a good compelling reason to uh, change to analog especially those in newer insulins which have a you know, peak less insulin. I totally agree the CGMS will help because though we are thinking of a polyglant test um, so with the CGMS probably an effective diet control without going into the population would help in recovery of the autonomic dysfunction. So, if, if uh, this hypoglycemic episodes are of recent onset, then within a few days recovery will be there. If not, if it's chronic means, if good control is there, no further episodes of hypoglycemia, by about three months he should recover from autonomic dysfunction and hypoglycemic abandonment. So we discussed about this, so we just said that we need to, uh, as uh, Dr. Anjali Madam said, we need to look for celiac disease, thyroid dysfunction, or Addison's disease and other monoclonal disorders. So we do an initial screen for celiac screen, as said, we will do an IgA level and also uh, transglutamase antibody levels. Like, uh, so if that's negative, when would you recommend rechecking it? Do you need to reach it? Possibly, I, I don't know. I think once the symptoms are settled and you manage the hypoglycemia and probably give a six months duration and reach it again. What, um, what about thyroid dysfunction? So, you do a thyroid screening and it turns out to be good. Some, some guidance suggest you do a thyroid function under CTX screen and diagnosis and then uh, do an annual thyroid screening. But again, it depends on the individual. There's no fixed, I don't think there's a fixed need for checking thyroid function annually unless there is a clinical company. So I just thought that we'll just highlight this. So this is the, these are the ADA guidelines and this is their recommendation. So they said, as uh, Madam said, we need to assess the presence of autoimmune conditions associated with type of diabetes at the diagnosis or if the symptom develops. And the recommendation for thyroid function, uh, thyroid disease is consider testing individuals with type 1 diabetes uh, for anti-thyroid antibodies um, soon after diagnosis and measure these uh, levels soon after diagnosis of type 1 diabetes once the glucose control has been established and if normal, keep checking it every one or two years or if they develop any symptoms. And for celiac disease, they say, suggest the same thing, check it at the time of diagnosis and consider re-evaluating three to five years after diagnosis uh, if the initial screen was negative. I think that's what they say. Uh, the only question is that the thyroid antibodies positivity is quite common in the gender population. So I think serum TSH would be a better. 
So if the initial one is negative, we'll just continue monitoring the CLT as a general in the three years. But there are antibodies at the point common in the general population, so antibody positive team may still not give us a good I think we have time for another case. Yeah, you have uh, five more minutes left. You can discuss another case, then we will take quick questions. This will be the last case. It's a 15 year old boy who was brought by his parents for a second opinion. He was diagnosed to have apparently type 1 diabetes one year back. It was in June 2016, he underwent a urine routine checkup for unrelated reason and it showed a 2 plus urine sugar. Subsequent test revealed the fasting plasma glucose of 456 mg with the HPLC of 7.9. On questioning the <coughs> clinical situation at the time of diagnosis, uh, there was no asthmatic symptoms at the time of diagnosis and it did not have any weight loss at the time of diagnosis. His initial urine ketone results were not available. Since the diagnosis, he is on twice daily insulin, premixed insulin, the total daily dose of 0.2 units per kg. And his father and his uh, father's father have diabetes since they are uh, age 30 to 35 years of age. And uh, his current BMI is 22 mg per meter square. There is no acanthosis clinically. And uh, on insulin, his current HP will see 6.9 percentage. So the questions for the panel is, uh, this patient was diagnosed to have type 1, labeled as type 1 diabetes. So this type 1 diabetes, or uh, you are not convinced about the diagnosis, it's something else. If the antibodies are negative, probably it would go towards more If the antibodies are positive, then type 1 is a positive. I think childhood type 1 diabetes remains the commonest uh, diagnosis for any diabetes present here in this age. So I wouldn't find fault with the first diagnosis. But probably a family history would have reached the diagnosis. He has not come with very high blood sugars. Three generations have been affected. He is a leaner boy, has no ketonuria, has a body mass index of uh, you know, he's below the age of 25 years. So we fix him with the diagnosis of Modi. It's less common, but it is still there. So I think we need to think about maturity on the set of diabetes in the young, considering a strong family history and a milder degree of uh, displacement. But I think the initial therapy we cannot find for any child would have come in on insulin, there is nothing wrong because the hypothyroidism remains the most common cause. But here we should need to work up our body and probably we can take him off insulin in that case and keep him on a good lifestyle and probably watch him. <coughs> so he needs a genetic work. So, generally suspect body in a young child presenting with uh, diabetes or hyperglycemia. Apart from the strong family history, any other clinical points which would point towards Modi? Antibodies being negative. Okay. Glycosy. So, leaving type 1 diabetes, how will you differentiate Modi from type 2 diabetes? Because type 2 diabetes also you will have a strong family history. So, how will you differentiate Modi from type 2 diabetes? Uh, children with Modi are thinner, they have a lesser body mass index compared to children with type 2 diabetes. The second thing is markers of insulin resistance. Uh, that may not be very, uh, you know, overly seen in our It's usually seen in obese children with type 2 diabetes. Because you won't see a tenth of the like they can skin tags in the uh, children with mood. Usually, in many of the situations, the, the initial diagnosis is not an issue, and you should always not be confirming in these situations the diagnosis on day one. You could label them on whatever initially, but the important thing is following them up then subsequently revisiting the diagnosis and trying to pin on the correct diagnosis is important both in the short term and in the long term. So clearly, if not in the first admission, we should always, that's the reason for reviewing this patient initially regularly so that we revise the whole thing. So this patient's uh, GAD antibody was negative uh, at this evaluation. So you stop the insulin and try oral medications. What will be the management at this point of time? Given the signing code is so negative. Uh, yeah, in this picture with no asthmatic uh, symptoms, I see no uh, uh, risk in trying this patient on oral antibiotic with close monitoring. And clearly in this case group, uh, 
uh, obviously it depends on are we going to do the genetic testing for Moody, which we should be doing, and the outcome depends on what it shows, whether it's uh, type 2 or type 2. So type 1 diabetes is the most common diagnosis, but given the clinical situation, consider other possibilities like type 2 or Moody. So sir, I have to get a diagnosis, so if you are suspecting Moody, for example, uh, a genetic screening which is done extensively now, um, so I will go for it, get the diagnosis and then uh, decide the management. Any one or two questions from the audience? Yeah, please take questions from the audience. How to plan insulin dose? How to plan this diet? Two third in the morning, one third in the night. Insulin dose for a newly directed type 1 diabetes. Question, sir. Can we fix their diet quantities for the morning and evening? In case of fever and stomach upsets, how to plan the insulin? For type 1? Yes. Uh, my personal approach would be for type 1 is to really go through the patient's individual uh, diet pattern and I, I usually try not to advise any diet straight away. The main issue is in a type 1. And the first approach is you, you design any regime where the patient is having uh, insulin in the system 24 hours a day. Uh, so that, that definitely a basal has to be the first one. And there is different approaches to, to try with the twice daily mix initially and until the patient gets used to it. And the other thing is just to first give a knowledge of uh, kids about carbohydrate counting. That is something uh, in time form. Uh, it is useful clearly. Uh, so, but it's not going to come initially. The initial thing is to make sure you're getting the insulin technique correct. And then it, it really doesn't matter how much you divide it, that's the first thing. Uh, the important thing is try to see how we can get monitoring. That is what's going to help us decide how we are going to tailor make the insulin. So, so the very, very key thing which we are practically not doing much is monitoring. Monitoring is the one which is going to tell us. Nobody knows what, how much insulin this patient is going to need. Monitoring is the one which is going to guide us. So that is the first key. So make sure the patient is on a basal insulin all the time and get the patient to do monitoring, view the patient and then gradually adjust and give the patient in a time on what they really need is to know approximately how to do a log count of what they are doing so that they can adjust the short acting insulin. So this should be the, one of the initial approach and clearly like any patients they should be explained about the sick day rules. And the very, very common situation we see is these patients having a stomach upset or something. They, they skip few meals, they are very unwell and they think, okay, I have not eaten anything, I will skip my insulin. And then the sugars go up and they become unwell and they come with their DKA. So that, that is very, very key not to omit insulin uh, at, uh, in these circumstances. So sick day rules are very important and equally important, we can prescribe something like a hypo or something. They need to keep it handy, which is the other end where we go into a hypo, tell them how to recognize. In a younger age group, it's a patient's family and everybody, they can also be very helpful in recognizing if the patient goes to a hypo or if they don't feel well, so that we have something handy. We wind up the session and uh, let's give a big hand to the analysts and the monitors. Uh, I request Muthi uh, sir to give mementos to our uh, panelists, uh, Dr. Suresh Damodaran and Dr. Satyat Dharma. And I request uh, Dr. Vela Ilam. I request Dr. Vela Adam to uh, honor our, our moderators, Dr. Manigandan and Dr. Sivan, with the uh, commentos.